delighted to talk in um, uh, four um, parties, four um, things, uh, to have an overview of what we've done in France. Um, the first part is epistemological uh, position. Uh, it's just to remind um, uh, you and me that even when we um, conduct biological and ecological analysis, we have also to um, interview sources, especially with region sources, of course, uh, with data from sources and um, excavation, and also from ethno uh, archaeology, uh, which is very, very important to uh, understand how um, you manage forests, for instance. And when we have done all this, it's a heavy work to collect and construct factual um, data from all the, um, the skills and uh, displays. And uh, new references, corpus also, a new method of analysis, and of course, source treatment, source process. And when we have done all this, I think we will be able to uh, better characterize plant corpus and its evolution, and better characterize also forest fields and their evolution, and also evaluate environmental impact from agriculture and craft activities, for instance, clearing. And one point um, I wanted to um, focus also is the importance of sampling, especially in this field of research. All the organic materials um, do not necessarily provide an environmental data. I will focus my, my talk about two main um, sources, charcoal and seeds. In order to get uh, reliable information that can be used to reconstruct landscape, a rigorous sampling and thieving protocol should be conducted, as well as selecting archaeological layers where uh, charcoal and seeds are located. I mean, for instance, if you wanted to uh, reconstruct landscape with charcoal from fireplace, it is useless. The selection of the right material in the appropriate way during the excavation is so very important. Second point, biological heritage. Um, I will just develop the example of the vine, Vitis vinifera, because it's uh, well uh, known today, with two questions. Wild, or cultivated wine, I mean you can, uh, cultivated is not domestication, you can cultivate wild wine, and domestication is when you change the biological <coughs> reproduction of the wine. Which variety for wine yards? Uh, the method we follow, or this team follow, is um, to build, produce a reference model from current population, and when you have it, you can apply to archaeological remains. So, uh, this is the current reference analyzed corpus for the vine. I will explain this diagram. It has been built by collecting a lot of pips from the current wild and cultivated varieties from the whole Mediterranean and also uh, from um, Central Europe and Western Europe and after they have been used a new tool with this um, that the ne um, which name is geometric morphometry I won't enter in further details but with this method we can have um, we can by a statistical treatment um, um, built different groups, um, this, this variety close to another, and so on. So, for instance, here, if I have, I have not the pointer. So, for instance, this group has, this variety has very close for each other, and the other one has uh, less close. So, when you have this reference current model, we can apply to archaeological material and perfectly discriminate 
wild vine seeds from cultivated wild seeds. And also, I have an idea of the biodiversity of our ancient landscape. For instance, here. In red, you have the group of um, um, varieties of wild wine, and in green, varieties of cultivated wine. This study has been done on the Greek century, Samos, Heras, uh, Samos, um, century of Hera in Samos, 5th century BC. I regret for the moment we have not a uh, medieval example, but I wish we have soon. So this is very uh, uh, interesting. Um, the current reference corpus from vegetation is now produced for um, a very few uh, species. Cherry trees, olive trees, palm trees, and vine. And that's all for the moment, because it's a very long um, time to produce this kind of um, um, corpora. Third point, landscapes, landscape evolution and morphology. Uh, we will travel in southern French Alps uh, here. Sorry, I, can, I cannot point um, the signs. It's in the um, Black Jack Valley, because in this valley of Southern French Hall, um, the archaeologists conduct a very big project, and uh, then uh, <coughs> survey, and uh, excavated a lot of shepherd huts, and we conduct um, a very um, accurate uh, charcoal analysis. And this is the whole um, uh, results of the diagrams. You can see that um, uh, from the Bronze Age until the early modern times, um, landscapes change a lot, especially because the forest of pine decreased, um, especially during medieval ages, and the large pools took place uh, instead of uh, single pine. And the more important change in the landscape, it's at the end of the medieval period, because you can see um, on the early medieval times that you have an open, an opening landscape with a lot of new species, especially bushes species. Um, I wanted to point out two um, important reasons. The temple pine is um, now that they completely disappear from the wall Alps. So it was interesting to um, rehabilitate this species because it was very important from ancient time and from the medieval period. And also that um, one thing you can um, um, heard in the media. I mean, uh, society destroyed, of course, biodiversity. But you have to balance this opinion because society can create also biodiversity, and it's what and this is um, what <coughs> this diagram illustrated. Because when they change the way the landscape, in order to have a lot of pasture, uh, of course you have uh, a marvelous biodiversity, new biodiversity. Uh, we stay for the second example in the far from French Alp, in L'Argentière d'ABC, because uh, um, there is um, a very important mines exploitation in Fournel, a silver lead exploitation between the, um, the 10th and 14th century. Um, what is in red on the map is the medieval um, galleries, and of course, we have done also um, anthropological analysis, and this is the result of the war result, which uh, show you also the landscape changing between the 11th century to the 14th century. And what is interesting? Uh, uh, sorry. What is interesting is that here you have um, an arrange for. Um, uh, large and spruce that decrease here at the end of the 12th century and 
between rising IVM in 13th century and decrease also here. And when this one, this group was quickest decrease, you have the pine, mountain pine, that increase. So, I mean, we have um, characterized cycle of forest exploitation and management. So, we can affirm that um, miners have um, a clever, in a clever way, managed the forest and preserved the forest in order to um, continue to exploit mine, of course, because they need wood for the mines. Uh, the last example, uh, we will go in in Provence, the far from e um, eastern uh, uh, part uh, in France, especially in a little region called Albion, where there is a lot of what we call in France uh, castra, and this castra presents a lot of traces of timbers um, in the rocks. So we record and measure all these traces of timber in the rock and classify them in diameters groups. After we done, uh, we did um, anthropological uh, approach on the archaeology sites where we identify a lot of uh, species, especially alipum pine and deciduous oak um, that were the most important species. Uh, we have uh, Ligneus open environment and we also study uh, the current vegetation uh, with the new tool dendrology and dendrometry approach. Uh, I mean we measure annual growth of alipantum pine and deciduous oak according to the fertility station in order to obtain a model of vegetation or growing vegetation. This is here for Alepon Pine and the city work. And because we have this model, we can um, cross with the classification of diameter group, because we have the number of stem by diameter group, and propose, and we are quite sure that in the Castra studies, the forest was, there was two kinds of forest, one in stem forest of a coppice forest, even in the beginning of the 12th century. Uh, last part, plant uses and practices. I will present the most beautiful example I think we have in France, which has been um, that I be studied by Maitia Rulas, a Dutch collective granary uh, in Dufos Castrum. We, uh, we leave Provence and go to Occitanie now, uh, in the Black uh, Mountains here, nearby Revel. This is the map of the um, excavation, um, with the higher tower here and the surrounding peasants' um, houses. And what is interesting with the granary, it's a collective granary. Uh, when uh, the excavation has been done, they found uh, 30, nearby 30 meters of um, layers of seeds, which is very important. Uh, of course, um, a square sampling in the granary has been done, and uh, 400,000 seeds has been recognized, and one 155 species identified. What is in very interesting that is the species were not mixed in the seeds layer, but there is a special distribution here. Each um, circle, it's um, um, a stock, um, stock species granary. And of course, this is uh, seeds results analysis with a lot of rye. Rye is um, species well adapted to mountains and um, mountains context because it's a very root cereals. Broad green in second position, wheat, and so on. 
So this is the main speakers. You have a lot of other, especially wild speakers. And this is very important because when the um, Matthias adds this kind of wild speakers, she can propose, um, she can reconstruct um, the way the fields were managed and rotation of cereals, I mean. This is a very particular context. You have the profile of um, the topographic profile of um, the castle sites here. What is interesting is here you have an alkaline pH because this is schist. And here you have a calcareous uh, soil, basic pH. And when we have these two kinds of, um, because we have these two <laughs> kinds of um, environment, we can position um, the fields. I mean, here you have dry pastures for sheep. This is the interpretation because rye can only grow in this kind of environment. And probably we have a rotation with rye and wheat and pasture, the, the, the second year. In here, it's the contrary. It's a basic um, environment well adapted to barley and wheat and probably we have one year wheat and barley and the second year a grass pasture for corn. And we have uh, forgotten meadows and orchard of course. Here we have the river, the soil and probably meadows and orchard were developed in this area. The second example is um, a question also. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, ah, okay. Um, where were the tree uh, fields irrigated during the medieval period? Why this question? It's because in the traditional state of heart of the olive tree cultivation in France, um, we thought that the rise of the olive tree culture took place only <coughs> in the 14th century because there are, bit, there are very little mention in the, the diplomatic documentation. The second point, if the olive tree cultivation is located in the hills and not in the valley. The third point, this plant does not need care. It can grow um, nearly wide. And the third, the fourth, is the techniques are coming from antiquity. So this is a map where I have recorded all, when I have recorded in red here, the star where, um, all um, the sequence in the palynological core, uh, where there is a sequence, a medieval <coughs> sequence with olive tree. And you can see that in the lower Rhone Valley, there is a lot of attestation, even in the Harlem Valley here, and also along the coast. The Green Star here, it cites archaeological medieval sites where we have um, recognized olive tree in charcoal. And when we cross the two, um, the, of course, um, olive tree fields were not only in the hill, but in the plains, in the valley, and um, they are very important. What we have done, it's the same thing. We have built, produced a reference model from current population of olive tree and applied to archaeological remains. My colleague, um, Jean-Frédéric Terral, uh, I've done a lot of um, sampling in wild, in wild olive tree here, our uh, cultivated and irrigated tree. And he has um, um, exploited a new way to um, uh, study charcoal, um, which is called quantitative economic eco-anatomical analysis. And this is a lot of measure, protocol of measurement with different criteria. And when we have done all this, 
we treat the results, the lot of measured uh, results by uh, canonical variant analysis. And what we could see that there is two axes. One axis separating um, cultivated and wild, and one other one separating uh, cultiv uh, uh, irrigation here and dry condition here. So the um, statistical treatment is very powerful to separate these groups, and because we have this, we have applied to um, archaeological sites, medieval archaeological sites, and this is the result. You can see that here we can, at the beginning of the 19th and 10th century, we do have irrigated olive tree, yeah, and here also, but it's more um, expected because it's um, at the end of the um, 15th century, but it was quite um, the question asked from uh, which from which society uh, give us techniques to irrigate olive, olive tree fields. Um, oh no, sorry, uh, <laughs> it's the last. I will finish on this. We have new tools to explore um, bioarchaeological remains. I mean, there is also new tools which are involving now, which are beginning to um, other way. For example, on woods, we have um, developed a program about ADN, DNA uh, in the woods in order to characterize um, linked of species. And I hope um, we can develop this kind of analyze because uh, I think uh, they are very interesting from my point of view, but I am a rural um, specialist and not a uh, uh, urban specialist. But uh, uh, in um, the urban context, there is a lot, a lot of water, of water locked material. So, I mean, you have a wonderful um, case to develop these kind of things. Thank you for your attention.